Good afternoon. I'm Marie Harf, the new executive director at Perry World House. This is my second day here, so welcome. I'm thrilled to be here, excited to be contributing to Perry World House's mission as a hub for global engagement at Penn and beyond. Today's edition of The World Today will focus on human rights at a time when fundamental freedoms are under threat in far too many places. Regional conflicts are proliferating excuse me, around the world. Authoritarianism is on the rise, and climate change is threatening entire regions. But there's some reason to be hopeful. The language and instruments of human rights continue to empower activists, deservedly challenge oppressive governments, and offer hope for the marginalized. With crises ongoing in Gaza, Ukraine, and Sudan, just to name a few, what can we expect of human rights in 2024? Can they still serve as a tool to liberate and protect? What role do human rights NGOs have in holding governments and other powerful agents accountable? To help us answer these questions and many more, we are very pleased to have with us a special guest today. Philip Alston is John Norton Pomeroy Professor of Law at New York University Law School. He has published extensively, and a new edition of his textbook on international human rights law will be released, released later this year. He has extensive experience as a human rights practitioner and has held various United Nations posts, the most recent being a special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights from 2014 to 2020. Our moderator today is someone very familiar to the Perry World House family, Zaid Rod Al Hussein. Zaid is currently the president and CEO of the International Peace Institute and the Perry World House Professor of the Practice of Law and Human Rights at the University of Pennsylvania. He is a longtime diplomat and has previously served as the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights from 2014 to 2018. Before we welcome our panelists on stage, however, I would like to take a moment to thank the Thakur family for generously supporting our global justice and human rights program and making today's event possible. Finally, I would like to remind you of a few things. First, we truly encourage audience participation and questions. Following the moderated conversation, we will open to questions from both our in-person attendees and our Zoom audiences as well. To ask a question, please head to the microphone, one right over here. For those joining remotely, please use the Q&A function to ask your question. And it should probably go without saying, but please keep your interventions brief, respectful, and appropriate. Without further ado now, please help me welcome our distinguished panelists to the stage. A good morning to all of you, and a good afternoon and good evening to those of you who are joining us online. Um, if uh, you Googled uh, the name Philip Alston, you come across two prominent uh, people. One is a star basketball player at uh, Loyola Chicago who has uh, built a name on dunking basketballs. And the other is the distinguished professor who we are, are honored and are privileged to listen to today, who dunks in a different form. <laughs> Uh, with uh, searing reports um, and often making points that others uh, will not dare make. Um, I have to say, in my, the four years I was uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the one person who always stood out in terms of the special rapporteurship, what we call special procedures, was Philip. I mean, extraordinarily courageous, with an exquisite mind, and just brilliant. So, uh, Philip, I'm going to, of course, put you on the spot right away and say the world looks like it's more scrambled than ever, or it's scrambling. Uh, there seems to be a weakening of uh, the respect for many of the regulatory frameworks we've created. Um, the tensions seem to, political tensions seem to be, uh, seem to be more acute. We have conflicts raging throughout the world. Um, few are being resolved successfully, and, and they're perhaps the most acute expression of human rights failure. Um, in your mind, looking at 2024 and what's, what we've just experienced, 
you know, what can you say uh, are continuing to be our major failures? And if we are uh, still doing certain things successfully, what are those successes in your mind? So an easy one to start off with. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, many thanks, uh, Zaid. Um, it was a huge uh, pleasure and privilege working with Zaid when he was the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and uh, he too stood out as someone who was uh, absolutely fearless and determined to hold governments and others to account, and that was very rare in that uh, diplomatic uh, context, uh, but also was a, a beacon of light for civil society movements around the world on so many different issues, so it's a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm, uh, um, I'm not depressed is the starting point, I guess. Uh, one could look at all of the major conflicts that are going on around the world today, uh, which are not being addressed uh, successfully, or in some cases even meaningfully, um, <coughs> and conclude that human rights have failed, I wouldn't go down that road because I think we need to look at a lot of other factors and a lot of other actors. Uh, so the reasons <coughs> for what's happening in a number of situations, and I won't get into specifics at least right now, um, is the complete failure of governments to have done what they could have done on the security front, on the economic front, on the political front, and I wouldn't attribute a lot of those problems to shortcomings of the human rights framework. We've got to keep in mind what human rights is really able to do, and there are limits uh, to that. Um, I think if we look at uh, oppressed peoples around the world, they have not given up on human rights. It's really all they've got to cling to is the claim that they, uh, that they have a right to self-determination or a right not to be tortured and locked up uh, or a right uh, as indigenous peoples to be able to live in the way that they want to. Um, so I think human rights still has a vital resonance I think when we go to situations like Gaza, for example, human rights and humanitarian law, as much as we can deplore their marginality, are still the lens through which we look at these things. Uh, the government of um, Prime Minister Netanyahu can be as dismissive and rude as he likes, but nonetheless the statements that follow more or less track the sort of international obligations that we're talking about. So it remains a, not even a, the framework for evaluating a lot of what's going on. Yes, I, I always used to uh, think that if governments were indeed dismissive and you took their statements at face value, it is rather strange that none of them have taken to the exits. They, they're all still attached to at least one human rights treaty, one international human rights treaty. And, and few would uh, say publicly, for instance, that they torture their people. Uh, even if we know that many uh, violate the provisions of the Convention Against Torture, and especially you know, the Article 3, the refoulement uh, provision. In, in your mind, uh, Philip, having spent most of your career in these areas, you know, do you make the argument that human rights, by its nature, is fundamentally a strong force in the human experience? And the only reason it's weak is that it's underserved, it's underfinanced, it's undersupported politically. Because, as Louise Arbour once said, the, the former High Commissioner for Human Rights, when you're in that space between a government and its people, you're really dancing on open nerves, basically, nerve endings. And so uh, would you make the argument that it is intensely powerful, it just, it's underserved in terms of resources and, and the political will to make it work the way we'd want to make it work? Uh, I mean, just on, on your first point, um, 
uh, an anecdote that <laughs> comes to my mind um, of the gap between what governments say and how they might be affected by human rights uh, was a report that I did back in, I mean, I, I started calling the United States to task for its targeted killings in 2004, and that ended with uh, a report in 2009 and another in 2010 going into quite some detail on why and how targeted killings violated international law in a range of ways. And when the most important of those reports came out, uh, the United States representative in the Human Rights Council said the following, thank you for your report, we sh look forward to reading it, <laughs> period. I then uh, went outside and there were a number of journalists uh, and they had all been in touch with people at Langley, Virginia and various other places and had lots of questions to ask. <coughs> um, about a week later I ran into a friend who was highly placed in the State Department and that person said to me, my God, if I have another meeting to discuss your stupid report, I'll shoot myself. Um, and so there was no public response, you know, this is an idiot, it's a ridiculous report and we reject it. But nonetheless, under the surface, these things can uh, provoke a lot of reflection, a lot of irritation, which is a good thing, uh, and I think some steps forward, but I won't go on to that. <coughs> um, so I don't want to derail the whole conversation, but Zaid knows this about me, I think. Uh, that I have a huge problem with the way in which we think about human rights uh, and the way in which it is understood and addressed in the world. So human rights basically go back to a certain vision which is in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948. That vision is of a, uh, a decent life for everyone. And a decent life for everyone means, yes, not being tortured, not being killed, uh, not being discriminated against on various grounds, but it also means a standard of living that is adequate to enable you to do any of those other things. And what happened very soon after 1948 was that the economic and social rights provisions which had originally come from, of all places, the United States, from FDR's fourth, no, second Bill of Rights proposal in 1943 or four, um, those economic and social rights were systematically marginalized and not paid attention to. And that is still the case today. You talk to anyone, you go to classes on human rights, uh, economic and social rights are just a little minor footnote. Uh, people working in the field don't think about economic and social rights a lot of the time. That's the first thing. The second thing is that human rights in the traditional sense, civil and political rights, are firmly rooted in an economic framework. Now, I don't want to sound unduly Marxist here. Uh, I'm not. But there is a very strong connection between economics and the enjoyment of human rights. So I think we in this country started to learn the lesson a little bit uh, thanks to the Black Lives Matter and related issues where it came to be much clearer that saying that you can't beat up a person because they're black and you can't shoot them because they're black is actually a very small part of the pie because the reason for the entrenched racism is the economic system. The economic system which ensures that a black kid gets lousy education, gets lousy health care and all the way up it's magnified and multiplied. But we don't think of that as a human rights issue. And to the extent that those structural dimensions of the economy are not tackled by those of us who advocate human rights, it's uh, sort of, it's not just uh, a failure, but it's almost guaranteeing that human rights won't come to have the impact they should. 
I mean, to go back, and, and this was a conversation that you and I had earlier today, uh, so many of the big crisis situations around the world began as sort of ethnic disputes or whatever, which were usually, uh, not always, I suppose, but usually grounded in economics, that we want those people off our land. We don't want those kids in our schools. We don't want to hear that stupid language. And to the extent that none of those things are addressed as human rights issues, they fester and eventually they explode. But even then, in the human rights area, we developed a thing called transitional justice. Transitional justice is great, but it comes in and says, for the most part, overwhelmingly, <laughs> we don't do economics, sorry. We're here to look at the people who were tortured and killed, and we're here to uh, occasionally maybe come up with some reparations, but even that's getting too much into the economics of it. But are you going to look at the land distribution, which was at the basis for the uh, all of the problem? No, 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 that's not us. That's someone else. And so the human rights community, I think, is very deficient uh, in terms of not addressing the key issues. Uh, and part of it is, part of it is, uh, what is it? I mean, it, it's a the French term deformation professionnelle, where you you have a certain profession and so, you know, every, what is it, every nail looks like a hammer, no, every, um, um, what's the expression? I can't even think of it now. Every, right, well, the only solution you have is the hammer. So in the human rights area, the only solution you have is lawyers, people like me. And if you say to the human rights people, all diplomats, and we've expanded that out then to journalists and public relations people, they make up most of the human rights profession. And if you start talking to them about IMF um, the programs or uh, the economic policies, let alone tax, you know, taxation is actually probably the single most important human rights issue that there is. That's where governments really let their priorities be known. What they exempt from tax, what they, who they give subsidies to, uh, and so on, is really so much of the actual policy that matters, that affects us all. Uh, you know, we could go into that in the race area, the home deduction, mortgage deductions and all that sort of thing and who wins and who loses. But the point is that if you go to a human rights organisation and say, what are you doing about this? They'll say, I think you came in the wrong door. There's a sort of economics consultancy around the corner and that's where you should go. So that means that we as a community um, are not uh, doing what we should do and we've also been too insular in not making partnerships. So the sort of stuff that you're doing now with Michael on climate change and so on, the whole value of that in a way is the interdisciplinarity of it. Whereas if you walked in and said, well, excuse me, I'm a lawyer and I want to talk to the other lawyers in the room, you know, you'd be making yourself largely irrelevant. I mean, what, what struck me visiting many countries is that when you look at those who are most repressed, the avenues for lawful protest are so constrained that you would demand of these populations to have produced a you know, MLK-like figure, charismatic, espousing nonviolence, or Gandhi, uh, to help the community out of the situation they're in. And if they don't have that, and they're forced into using violence, and God knows we, we absolutely you know, would, would condemn that, but you, you're putting people in a situation where they're absolutely desperate. And then the moment they take to the gun, they're terrorists, and you're, you can mow them down, essentially, and the public would be behind you. So it's, it's a dangerous sort of proposition that we're dealing with. Philip, you mentioned your reports, and when you were uh, a special rapporteur for, on extreme poverty, uh, you produced a whole slew of reports, and some were on countries like uh, Chile and Saudi Arabia and so forth. 
but you also you know, produced a report on China, on the UK, and the US, and you sort of touched upon this. That was a very deliberate decision in support of the view that you just articulated. You, you wanted to pull the lion's tail, so to speak, I, and you wanted to be provocative, because I, I remember the, the exchange you had with a certain uh, British minister, I think it was Amber Rudd, and she was furious but she didn't answer the points that you put to, to the British government. So could you just comment on, on what drove you to select the countries that you selected? And, and did you think in the end that it sort of is the right trajectory for the ones who succeeded you in that post or the one who succeeded to follow, to follow suit, basically? That extreme poverty is to be found everywhere, essentially, if governments are delinquent or if they're imposing uh, austerity measures without any forethought, uh, the damage can be considerable and generational or intergenerational. Uh, I mean, my uh, theme or whatever was that uh, poverty is a political choice. And we saw that perfectly illustrated during COVID uh, because suddenly people who were at risk of poverty looked a little bit like Zaid or me, and that is completely unacceptable. So therefore, governments have to increase child benefit, have to increase other um, ways in which they support people. Uh, but as soon as COVID is over, those benefits are rescinded because it's no longer the middle classes who are in need of them and it's back to the downtrodden and despised uh, and we're not going to be supporting them. Uh, I mean, I think... Um, I. I do think that uh, human rights uh, change needs to be thought of in political terms. Uh, if you can't change the political equation, you're not going to, uh, you know, appealing to people and saying, oh, it's terrible that you treat black people that way or people with disabilities, couldn't you do better? Uh, you know, the answer is going to be, oh yeah, of course we will, absolutely, thanks for coming by. Uh, but if one can elevate it in some way so that it actually becomes a political problem. Uh, I mean, you mentioned, uh, so my visit to the United Kingdom, for example, um, where uh, we managed to get a lot of uh, publicity at every point. That was not accidental. We had spent a lot of time drawing up a media strategy and working with journalists and making sure that would happen. But at the end of the mission, there were well over 4,000 separate media articles on just that trip, which is uh, huge. And uh, people haven't stopped telling me that that intervention changed the uh, the general approach in the UK. And I think what we're seeing now as the Conservative government um, is under ever more pressure uh, is that the impact of the 2010 uh, radical austerity measures that were introduced by the Conservative government and that have led to a complete downward spiral in the UK of social standards of care, uh, of solidarity and so on, are simply not sustainable. And I think by focusing, by shining something of a spotlight on that, uh, it makes uh, a difference. I mean, the thing about, just to say, I think one of the things that Amber Rudd said, she was the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, but the, the Prime Minister also said it in the House of Commons on a couple of occasions, uh, that they were particularly offended by my language. Uh, of course, as an Australian, I could give them language, but um, they didn't mean that. What they meant was that I was speaking more like a politician than like a diplomat. So instead of going to the UK and saying, uh, gosh, uh, you know, old chaps, uh, it seems to me that you might be doing a little bit more for those uh, people who don't have quite enough money, and it would be very useful if you, etc. Instead, one can reframe that in ways that actually hurt because they call into question the bona fides and even the good faith, uh, the, uh, even the, 
well-meaning of the, the government and put it on the back foot and force it to uh, engage. Yeah, no, I, I face that how dare you uh, sort of uh, response uh, quite often. And I, you know, being a Jordanian, you can imagine, you know, being in Northern Europe and how the reactions would be because they'd expect me to talk about situations in the developing world. And I'd be, no, 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 I'm talking, would like to discuss the situation in, inside your country. And they just couldn't wrap their heads around it. Because we live in the US, you famously said that when you produce your report about the United States, that uh, Los Angeles was 50 blocks of the humiliation of humanity. Um, and it also elicited quite a strong response, uh, Philip. Why, you know, having mentioned the fact that economic and uh, social rights derive from FDR, why is this such a persistent problem in the US, in many of the places you visited, in, in, including in the Deep South and Alabama and so forth. Why is it so persistent? I mean, that's a very complicated question, of course. There are, you know, the origins of the revolution. I've al always uh, been uh, struck by the fact that the uh, French Revolution uh, ended up uh, demanding a state that would care. That's what the demand was. The American Revolution is get the king and the state the hell out of here and leave us alone. That's a sort of starting point. Um, you've then got the role played by business uh, in the US, which is, I think, uniquely powerful, even though private actors are always powerful in relation to governments. Um, You've got a libertarian movement, which is very powerful. Um, but the, the th I guess the, the, I mean the main point in the US is that w when I talk about human rights, I like to focus on uh, it as a tool for outrage. In other words, uh, if I were to get up and hit Zaid now, uh, people would not say, gosh, that's a violation of the Pennsylvania criminal law or whatever. They would say, that's a, excuse my Australian, that's a bloody outrage. Uh, you can't do that to another human being. But until we get to the stage where we say, you see this little girl, she's not in school because she's a girl. You see this kid, they have no food because they're not of the major uh, part of the population. They're not white. Um, and that should evoke outrage. But certainly in the United States it doesn't. It's, ah, well, you know, <laughs> that's the way it is. And there's this deep-seated belief that the United States gives all of us what we deserve. It's the land of opportunity. And it absolutely ain't. It's the land of endless opportunities for the elite uh, and of completely um, constrained uh, non-opportunities uh, for those at the bottom. So it's no you know, uh, puzzle that social mobility, the great American dream, social mobility here is lower than in most other developed societies. Uh, if you're poor, you're going to stay there. If you're rich, you're going to stay there. No, I, 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 you know, what you're saying you know, strikes me um, in, 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 for its accuracy because I, I live in New York and like you I have an occasion to spend a lot of time with people in Wall Street and one should not overgeneralize this point clearly it would be a mistake to do so but it's amazing how many people believe that they get to where they've got to simply through wits and brilliance alone and they don't give adequate allowance to just chance and luck that you were mentored by the right teacher, that you were in a primary school that had equipment that worked, that you had someone in a career's office who pointed to you in the right direction. They never seem to give a sort of a, a nod to chance and luck. And I mean, I had an extremely privileged upbringing and I just, through sheer luck, my, uh, one of the first people I worked for is Kofi Annan. I was his personal assistant, I was 30 years old. And I can't claim that my whole UN career was through some sort of 
intellectual gift I had. I was lucky that I was where I was, and he came along, and he mentored, and I learned from him. And that sort of incorporation is not often... But, but of course, that's not luck. No. That's privilege. But that's privilege as well. You w didn't come to Coffee's um, attention because you were extremely good looking or... Uh, well, don't exclude that <laughs> completely from the equation. Or even, it may because, have had a even because you were super bright, you had to get all the educational qualifications that were part of the privileged uh, upbringing. And then you had to be in a situation where he would look at you and you'd be of interest. So that's the point. I mean, this is, uh, I forget, uh, I think some state actually legislated this recently that you cannot, if you talk about meritocracy, you're not allowed to link that to racism and sexism. Uh, you know, you can't say that people like you and I are where we are because we're white males. But that is a crucial part of it. That's what meritocracy is all about. And that's why we can say, well, we earned what we have achieved, when in fact it is, we were both very lucky to have parents who were wealthy enough to be able to give us the best opportunities. Um, and that's where so many people fail. So it's more, um, it's more the, it's less the question of luck in my sense. So if, if I can then take this one more step and then we'll open up the, the floor for questions. So um, if we can sort of turn the gun on ourselves a little bit. The human rights movement, are we ourselves too elitist? Um, if you look at the vernacular used in international human rights, it's very loyally, it's very technical, some, or at least some of it's very technical, and you chaired the uh, Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights for many years. The general comments are designed for lawyers, really. Do we create a barrier between ourselves and people? I mean, the beauty with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is that it was simple language used in all the 30 articles. And are we, have we made it technical simply because we see ourselves as professionals and therefore and we want our vanity to sort of be, ex I mean, basically, we, it's a whole exercise in stoking our vanities and removing ourselves from people who are really doing the hard work, which is the frontline human rights defenders in countries who, who we sort of distance ourselves from. Is that, a, is that an a, a, a appropriate critique of us? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think that one of the big problems I have, because it's too complex to go into in most uh, contexts, is if people say, what do you think about human rights or how, what's the state of human rights? The question is, what the hell do you mean by human rights? Because human rights can be the norms, the values. Are the values still valid? It can be the institutions. Is the UN useful? It can be civil society. Is Human Rights Watch doing good stuff? But the reality of human rights, and I'm not just saying this, you know, because it's, I think it's the right thing to say. The huge privilege I had as a special rapporteur was visiting, I don't know, 30, no more, 40, 45 countries, and not just speaking to the goddamn chief justice and the foreign minister or whatever, but going out into the bush, as we say in Australia, out into the field. Uh, and actually speaking to grassroots groups. And they're not sitting there talking in UN language or focusing on the issues that we focus on. So what happens is that when it then gets translated upwards, we say, well, my good man, uh, I'll handle that for you. Let me put it into UN terms. And in doing that, you eliminate many of their real grievances and you start, you say, well, we have a working group on that, so it could go there. But the mere funneling into that working group changes the terms of the grievance and of the possible remedies and really distorts it in a big way. Yeah. I, I began to think at some stage that the uh, member states of the UN were very clever, and perhaps it's giving them too much credit, by designing a Geneva-centric sort of system of human rights. Because what they're doing <laughs> is they want everyone from, let's say, let's say everyone representing governments to go to Geneva and then don't really like people like Philip Alston 
going into that backyard for precisely that reason, that you're listening to people who are giving you the, their grievances in an undiluted form. And as you said, then there's a translation problem where then we put it into Latin and we use all sorts of uh, expressions and then destroy part of what they're saying. Um, can we open up the, the floor to questions? I was told that 35 minutes past, uh, we would open up, and if not, then I can continue to ask Philip uh, questions. We have a microphone right there, and if you would be willing to come up, uh, please do. I don't know if you would. Yeah. Uh, I, I, about, uh, should people queue? Uh, line yeah. Up? Yeah? I'm going to ask a question first on behalf of the online audience. Okay. Uh, so someone has a question about uh, South Africa's ICJ case against Israel and whether you think it will be effective in stopping the killings of civilians in Gaza. Of course. <laughs> Instantly. Um, um, I mean, clearly the formal answer is no. It hasn't stopped anything. Uh, but I think this is all about a longer term change in perceptions and legitimacy. And I think that the court has uh, done the right thing in terms of ordering that a very different approach be used and that a genuinely humanitarian uh, entry point be facilitated. Uh, but Legitimacy really is central, and the way in which Israel is proceeding now is massively losing legitimacy, uh, and I think that is a huge problem. I wish that were not the case, and I think the pressure that the International Court of Justice has generated is an important one. It's, also, it's turned this into a major public issue. It compels governments to keep looking at it, uh, it, in theory, will require the Israeli government to report in a couple of weeks on what they've done, which will be... Yes, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, it's also interesting to really read the measures in detail and see who voted for the measures. I, I think it's very instructive. And uh, read the decisions or the opinions of the Israeli judge on measures four and five. I think that's also instructive. Um, the next question, please, sir. It's been a pleasure listening to you both and uh, the questions and the discussion. And uh, there is a, a seems to be a, a, a wall that we come up with when it comes to human rights. And that wall, uh, one needs vision and wisdom to transcend that wall. Uh, for instance, a criticism was in rational thinking. Um, uh, Joan Robinson, who was a professor of economics at uh, Cambridge University, had once said, in the long run, it is all about the short run. Now, that is something that the ancient Greeks addressed. And I have a quote from Plato who said, we saw the heavens and the movement of the sun and the moon and the stars. And from that derived the notion of time, which we apply to our lives. One of the visionary ideas that has come with uh, US Declaration of Independence was protection of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, in this, happiness has, Jefferson didn't know it, Freud didn't know it, and this is still very much up in the air. Liberty, that's where I see a potential an exper for exploring this uh, possibility of human rights as a natural right. Um, it, it, when we look at liberty, we think in terms of freedom and the necessity of a free society for that to be possible. But a free society is a conundrum because society cannot exist without caring for the other, but if you are free, why should you care for the other? So how do we Thank have you. a free society? Philip, how would you answer the question? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> 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 um, 
Well, I mean, I uh, I appreciate your uh, your observations. I think uh, uh, I mean I I won't get into definitional stuff, but I think one could determine uh, could define freedom or liberty in ways that go way beyond uh, the w the perspective that we currently have. Uh, I mean, one example, but I'm sorry to be a lawyer here, but the um, Constitution of India uh, says that there is a right to life. And the Indian Supreme Court over many years said that doesn't mean what we international lawyers traditionally thought, which is that you cannot kill someone arbitrarily. That means that people actually have a right to live. And living doesn't mean just taking in air and pushing out whatever. It means having a life. Uh, it means being able to function, being able to work, uh, being able to play, being able to be with your family. And so you can interpret, I think, um, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I don't think that it's preordained that we need to have a libertarian uh, approach to what that really means. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Professor Sachenko. Thank you so much for the lecture. And uh, my, my field is international labor law. And in our field, you are very famous for your criticism of the ILO declaration on, and on its prioritizing of four, now already five, fundamental labor rights. <coughs> I wanted to ask, so almost more than 20 years has passed since the adoption of this ILO declaration. How do you evaluate these 20 years, if it was a success or a failure of the ILO, and if you were a director general, what would you do now in order to enhance international labor standards? Thank you. Perhaps you can give the background as well for it. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so that's a very big set of issues, and in essence it goes from, well, the International Labor Organization founded in 1919. Uh, the reason the ILO was founded was to give the Western world a meaningful response to the threat of communism. In other words, communism was increasingly attractive to Americans, to Europeans and others, and that got our leaders very uptight back in 1919. And they thought that it was only if they could say to the workers, we are here to guarantee you certain minimum conditions in terms of working hours, in terms of rest, uh, in terms of working conditions and so on, that the appeal of communism would be diluted. So one way of doing that is through regulation, is through laws that say that people should not work more than X hours or people should be able to join trade unions and so on. At a certain point, and I'm really simplifying here, you know, in ways that will no doubt horrify you, the ILO said, um, this is not working, this more legalistic approach to it. And so what we need to do is to introduce a sort of softer option where we will say that all states that are members of the ILO will have to respect certain principles, but they will be expressed in a softer way rather than formal legal obligations. And it's the story of the world. So if we take labor rights in the world, sorry to go off uh, on a tangent here, but for 30 seconds, um, labor rights are minimal in the United States. Unions have been utterly marginalized, and the consequence of that is that labor conditions are atrocious. Uh, that we can now reduce the, uh, well, it's not just the gig economy, uh, it's the standard economy. Universities, we're in university, I know nothing about Penn, but I know about New York University where I come from, and I think it's typical. Everything is outsourced. So you can't go to our administration and say, why is it that the people who work all around the buildings are paid atrociously? And why do they have a retirement income of $1,200 a month? $15,000 you're going to live on when you're 65. 
you and your family. And that's the sort of labor contracts that are being, not negotiated, are being foist upon people because there is no regulation of minimal standards. And so I do think that in the longer term, one has to get back to a harder, more specific approach because otherwise there's no end to the exploitation of the average worker. You simply, that's what private equity is all about. In every direction that it moves, whether it's nursing homes or uh, housing or uh, anything, private equity comes in and slashes uh, salaries and conditions, uh, reduces the um, services that are provided, then puts the whole enterprise up for sale, um, having basically devastated what was there before and eliminated all basic standards of decency. Sorry to go on a rant, but it's, you know, the whole, the importance of labor rights is, for me, central. And I don't think that the approach being applied by the ILO treats labor rights as human rights. Over. Uh, another question from the online audience. Someone asked, do you, do you think that nation states pose the greatest threat to human rights or should we also be worried about private actors? Uh, I mean, that uh, perhaps it was one of my uh, assistants back at NYU who phoned that in. Um, <laughs> um, the, uh, w one of the biggest things that I'm working on now is what I unfortunately call privatization. Um, I, unfortunately, because it's not an adequate word to describe what's really going on. But uh, huge swathes of our economy. There was a book published a couple of years ago called The Privatization of Everything. And that's what's happening in our societies, that everything is now in the hands of the private sector. That as taxes are increasingly cut and cut, governments have ever less influence. They don't have the money to be able to do anything. So we are very much at the mercy of the private sector. And in the human rights area, we have almost entirely failed to come up with any framework that is particularly meaningful. We play around with soft standards. We get assurances from corporations that, oh, yes, they're going to devote more attention to the environment. And labor is very close to our hearts and so on. There is no way of enforcing any of that, and it's not happening. And so I think, yes, the state is becoming ever less significant in this area. It has almost no, capa no capacity these days to regulate so what happens is that entire sectors are privatized, whether it's transport or uh, water or social care. And the government will say, well, you're taking this over from us, but you better respect basic standards. And the corporation says, absolutely, of course we will. That's what we're all about. One minute later, the governments are jumping up in their chair and saying, hooray, we're rid of that responsibility. They can't hold us responsible anymore for that. And the corporate people are saying, yeah, of course we're going to follow their standards like hell. We're here to make money, which is what corporations are all about. It's what I'd be all about if I was a corporate actor. You make money. So you've got to cut all of the other costs. Um, and I think the, the privatization of the entire economy is proceeding at a huge pace. Um, worldwide, and that is an enormous threat to human rights. Thank you. Uh, Fernando, another distinguished professor. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your visit to Penn. My question has to do with implementation of treaty obligations. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Faria Khan, and I are teaching a course this semester on whether race has an impact on your access to human rights, the right to education, right to medical care, the right to housing, mortgage, et cetera. After the semester is over, we're taking 19 students to Greece to see how race plays uh, how race plays out in a country like Greece. Just to use an example, both Greece and the U.S. have signed the Refugee Treaty, and both Greece and the U.S. deport people despite their having signed a treaty on re uh, protecting refugees. So my question to you is, what recommendation do you have on? Um, how to force governments to implement contracts that they have signed? Well, 
Well, uh, I mean, I could give you a technical a set of technical answers because I'm an international lawyer and I'm actually teaching the introductory course this very semester, uh, but I won't. I think the key thing about treaties is that unless there is significant community support, governments are not going to take a lot of their obligations seriously. And so until we can address some of the community attitudes, and when you talk about migration and so on, you know, that's the biggest single, in some ways it might even be bigger than, human, than climate change. You know, climate change we know is going to transform the world, but I think migration is in the process of doing that uh, right now. Uh, because in virtually every country that I know, there is a huge backlash, yes, pushed by populists and others for often all the wrong reasons, but nonetheless appealing deeply to the nativism in all of us that I don't want people like that in my country. Um, and I think that is overwhelming us. I'm sorry to be reductionist, there's only one solution for me, and that is that having done absolutely nothing about inequality at a global level, do you wonder that everyone in the, the what used to be called the third world is very keen to come to the first world and get some sort of basic decent living? Of course not. I would be in the queue as well. But we do nothing to address inequality globally. In fact, we're doing the opposite. Um, and so I think this is going to be a, a tsunami which is going to hit us all. And I say that coming from a country, Australia, which proudly started most of this by insisting that uh, we would not have any filthy refugees coming into our country unless they lined up and did it in an orderly manner. And if they didn't, we'd immediately export them to uh, torture stations in uh, neighboring islands. So, thank you. Eileen, please. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is going to be about how you go about designing a campaign for economic rights, right? So, uh, in the human rights class I teach, my students watch a PBS uh, uh, short on extreme poverty in Alabama, in which you're featured. And the comments you just made about the structural foundations and economic foundations of racism in the United States is, is so compelling. But it's harder to think about lines of accountability and specific remedies, I think, in those contexts than you know, release somebody from jail, free Nelson Mandela, et cetera. Um, so how do you think about that? And how do you think about remedy? Uh, well, it sort of, it, it goes back in a way to my outrage point. So I'm outraged that so many Americans don't have access to health care. I mean, I'm really outraged, but that's because I come from a, a country, Australia introduced a universal health care system in 1973, basically, but even before then it wasn't too bad. Uh, my wife is Irish, I spent a lot of time in Europe, uh, you know, I was very sick in uh, some uh, rather pathetic thing in the end when I was in Spain for six months. Um, and I was so panicked that I raced down to the local hospital and they said, well, who are you? And I you know, said, well, my, here's my name and so on. And they said, well, where's your identification? And I said, oh my God, I left at home. And they said, never mind, forget about that. We can fill that in later on. And as I was leaving after hours of tests that they had done between midnight and 6 a.m., I said, hang on a minute, you know, should I come back with my passport? And they said, well, no, you've told us your name and give us details and so on, that's enough, because we provide healthcare for everyone here. Um, and so I would be, you know, I think that the, the history in the U.S. is interesting that um, it was uh, that Obama was getting cold feet about Obamacare and it was Pelosi who said you cannot do this we've got to go through with it uh, I think it's resonated a lot but I don't think that uh, mainstream politicians have been prepared to follow Bernie uh, and saying there is a goddamned right to health 
and that any society that doesn't provide minimal protections for people that says that if you suddenly can't work, bad luck, you don't get access. You want to get access? Go to work. Get a job that's good enough and then you'll get it. Well, excuse me, that's the wrong way around. So I think that the, you've got to focus on the specifics of it. I think housing is going to be another huge issue. And the good thing about housing is that we focus on the people in LA who are living on the streets and in tents and so on. But that's not where the political action is. No one gives a damn about those people. They are the forgotten. The people who are going to need housing are the people in this audience. Because housing prices uh, are being permitted to get so out of kilter that the average middle class person is not going to have access to affordable, decent housing. And you won't have the accumulated wealth of my generation, which is, as we say elsewhere, creaming it, uh, because we were able to acquire houses, not that I own one, I should, but, uh, and, and all the other uh, at wealthy, all the other attributes of wealth when it was much easier. But to the current generation and the coming generation, that's going to be much more difficult. So again, a campaign to actually start thinking about social housing. You know, social housing, I forget what the percentage is, but in Vienna, is about 50% of the population. And social housing doesn't mean crap accommodation that you wouldn't want to stay in for more than one night. It means somewhere that is socially acceptable. And we're going to make sure that every person, every citizen, has that. And again, I think there's a need for a massive housing campaign, but not just focused on the tents and the hardest cases, but on us and the fact that governments are ignoring it and that the economic policies that the Congress is adopting are just exacerbating uh, the situation. Just uh, to follow up on Eileen's point, I mean, the need for these sort of campaigns, uh, you're making a compelling case for them, would it help also if the US were to have a national human rights commission like that exists in many countries around the world? Um, there is a civil rights commission. It's not as powerful as it ought to be. But should there not be a national human rights commission where all of these arguments could be brought to the fore and then a campaign behind it as well? And is, is that not a sort of way station that can be fought for? Um, it, it's ironic. Uh, there's never a good formula for a lot of these sorts of things because any formula that you come up with looks great and then over time it's suddenly it's subverted or undermined. And so the formula in the US has always been bipartisan. And so the Civil Rights Commission is bipartisan. But bipartisan today means absolutely deadlocked and unable to move. And so in other countries... There is this idea that you have a human rights commission, which is not bipartisan, but is independent uh, and is composed of a range of people. You might have a judge on it, but you should also have a community organizer, you know, from a group of women factory workers, uh, so that these commissions are generating ideas and uh, trying and putting on the agenda even if the arrogant decision makers say no time for that nonsense uh, they're still continuing to pump out stuff and that becomes much more effective so when i came in as a special rapporteur i'm still some idiot outsider i'm still someone who is from a country you know 12,000 miles away and speaks terrible uh, english uh, and is not one of us and shouldn't be taken seriously. But if you've got your own Human Rights Commission and you've got people who develop a profile and so on, given some empowerment to speak on these issues, it can make a big difference. Uh, you're far from being an idiot. <laughs> but you're, uh, you're one of the greatest exponents for the uh, cause of human rights, Philip, and it's an enormous privilege that you're going to spend a few days with us. I hope that many of the students here and, and certainly the faculty will have an opportunity to sit with you for uh, detailed, uh, more detailed discussions. 
But thank you for participating in this uh, public lecture. Maybe we'll express our appreciation to <laughs> Professor Philip. <laughs> <laughs>